Krishna, dear devotees, welcome back once again to our ongoing lecture series here from Sri Vrindavan Dham in India. Nama Om Vishnu Padaya Krishna Prashtaya Bhutale Srimati Bhaktivedanta Swamaniti Namane Namaste Saraswati Deve Goravani Pacharine Nirvishesha Shunyavadi Pastata Deshatarane O glorious Srila Prabhupada. So um, we have been discussing several holy places that we visited in our uh, recent trip uh, across India, which Lord Chaitanya visited in his uh, travels 500 years ago. And as we mentioned in an earlier class, our motivation, um, as always, uh, was the words of Sridhar Prabhupada uh, in a purport in Chaitanya Charitamrita, Antya Leela, um, chapter 4, verse uh, 211. Prabhupada writes, a devotee should make a point of visiting all the places where Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu performed his pastimes. Indeed, pure devotees of Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu even want to see the places he simply visited for only hours or minutes. Hare Krishna. <clears throat> and so far we've discussed our uh, visit to Gaya and to Bodh Gaya and uh, the Jarikunda forest. So today we'll conclude um, our, with our visit to Mayapur, our community in, in Mayapur. That was the last stop in our pilgrimage. And because we have lectured extensively about uh, Navadvi Mayapur in our recent lectures, well, over the last two years, I'll take a little different approach today and just speak about our arrival and our welcoming uh, in, in Mayapur from the uh, the Vedic perspective. So first is how uh, we prepared ourselves to arrive um, in Mayapur. And as we were approaching that sacred abode in our cars, I was meditating on Akura as he approached Vrindavan. Essentially, there's no difference between Vrindavan and Mayapur. Uh, Srila Narottam Das Thakur, one of our great heroes, he, he sings in one of his uh, songs, Shri Goda Mandala Bhumi Yeva Jhane Chintamani Tarahaya Brajabhumi Vasha. He writes, um, one should know that Goda Mandala Bhumi, Mayapur, is equal to Vrindavan. There's no difference between the inhabitants um, of Vrindavan and those of Sridham Mayapur. Now, it's for this reason, uh, it's said, that Gauri Vaishnavas are happy to live in either one or both of those sacred places. Uh, in my studies, I've seen that our Acharyas, in the past, they go back and forth. Sometimes they're in Mayapur, then they come to Vrindavan, they go back to Mayapur, maybe a quick trip to, to Puri, like that. <clears throat> but even our Iskand devotees now, um, we, we like to go between Vrindavan and Mayapur, Prabhupada, organized it that way. I remember in the 1970s, we'd have our annual Mayapur festival in his presence, usually in, in March, Gorpurnima, and afterwards we'd all go with Sri Prabhupada to Vrindavan for the second part of the celebrations. So there's a prediction like that, actually in Garuda Purana, that these two places, Vrindavan and Navadweep or Mayapur, <coughs> they would be the most uh, they would, you could say, be uh, the places that uh, devotees, Gaudiya Vaishnavas would like to live. And Guruta Purana says, Sadava Kali Kale Tu, Trakmanya Tita Shevanam, Vinda Ranye Tava Shektre, Navadvipe Vishanti Va. And I quote, In the age of Kali, Devotees will abandon the service of other holy places and will live either in Vrindavan or Navadweep. Purana means very ancient. So the Garuda Purana is stating that in the age of Kali, devotees will abandon the service of other holy places and will live in either Navadweep or Vrindavan or Navadweep. Wow. <coughs> so as Akura approached uh, Vrindavan, uh, to begin with, he was meditating on his good fortune of even being able to come to an abode of, the, of our beloved Lord. And in a mood, of, a mood of humility, he felt himself very unqualified 
For example, he was thinking, this was from Srimad Bhagavatam, of course, what auspicious acts have I done? What uh, severe austerities have I undergone? What charities have I performed to be able to enter into Vrindavan? I'm just a wretched, materialistic person absorbed in sense enjoyment. Now here's a devotee he's approaching the Dham, but expressing such humility. I don't really have any qualification. This is a qualification for entering into the Dham. <coughs> now the Acharyas say that uh, the humility expressed by Akura is a prerequisite, prerequisite for anyone desiring to enter Braj. And we see this same humility demonstrated uh, when Prahlad Maharaj was asked by Lord Brahma to approach Lord Nisringadev. Prahlad said, uh, how is it possible for me, who have been born in a family of Asuras, to offer suitable prayers to satisfy the Supreme Personality of Godhead? Even until now, all the demigods headed by Lord Brahma and all the saintly persons could not satisfy the Lord by streams of excellent words. Although such persons are very qualified, being uh, in the mode of goodness, then what is to be said of me? I am not all qualified. Humility. Actually, unless one is meek and, and humble, to make uh, progress in spiritual life, it's very difficult. Srila Krishnadas Kaviraj Goswami, uh, the author of Chaitanya Charitamrita, he speaks in a similar way in uh, Adi Lila chapter 5, uh, verse 205. He says, Jagai Mare Haite Muni Se Papishta. Puri Shara Hita Haite Muni Se Lagishta. Bengali. I am more sinful than Jagai Madhai and even lower than the worms in the stool. <laughs> this is extreme humility. <laughs> but it's not that he's just saying it, he actually feels it. Bhakti means to say things and do things and offer things with feeling, with devotion. So this is, he's not exaggerating. He actually feels like that. I am more sinful than Jagai and Madhai, and even lower than the worms in the stool. And as we know, our Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, he, in the mood of a devotee, he also stressed humility. Um, one should chant the holy name of the Lord in a humble state of mind, thinking oneself lower than the straw on the street. Uh, one should be more tolerant than a tree, devoid of all sense of false prestige, and one should be ready to offer um, all respect to others. In such a state of mind, one can chant the holy name of the Lord constantly. Such an important verse. <laughs> Actually, Lord Chaitanya considered this verse, this instruction, so important that after proclaiming it, we read this in the Chaitanya Charitamrita, after proclaiming it, he added, Udva bahu kari kohan shuna sharva loka namashutari ghanti bhara kante e shloka quote from the mouth of the Lord raising my hands I declare everyone please hear me string this verse on the thread of the holy name and wear it on your neck for continuous remembrance wow raising my hands Mahaprabhu says, I declare, everyone please hear me, everyone. String this verse on the thread of the holy name and wear it on your neck for continuous remembrance. I remember in the early years, my dear God sister, Kishori Dasi, uh, she'd often cook for Sridhar Prabhupada when, when uh, th they were in India. And uh, she actually went to a, a tattoo artist, uh, I think in, in, uh, in Bombay at that time, and had that, that verse tattooed um, around her neck. <laughs> so yeah, not that the first tattoo in Iskon. <laughs> so, um, raising my hands I declare, everyone please hear me, string this verse in the thread of the holy name and wear it on your neck for continuous remembrance. 
But we should note that while a devotee thinks himself or herself fallen, he is simultaneously confident that the Lord will pick him up. We're very fallen, you know, no, we have no adhikari, no qualifications, but you know, we don't want it to lead us to the point of despondency. Because simultaneously, we are confident that Krishna will pick us up, as he has done. He's picked us up already out of the ocean of material existence. So in our fallen state, he can continue to pick us up. And that's a hope we have. That's the hope we have. And Rupa Goswami, uh, he prays like this uh, two times that I know of in Padyavali, his verse book, in, in text 60, this, this mood of helplessness and, you know, fallen but hopeful. Uh, it's there in text 60. One of my favorite verses, he writes, I am drowning in the painful, fathomless whirlpool of repeated birth and death. O Lord, O friend of those who have no shelter, O effulgent moon of mercy, please, just this one time, quickly extend your hand to save me. How many times have I quoted that? <laughs> For so many times. And in text 61, similar sentiment. He writes, The elephant of my mind is drowning in the waters of material illusion strongly held by the ferocious crocodile of the threefold miseries, it anxiously cries with fear in its heart, O oh Lord Hari, please rescue it with your glowing Sudarsan chakra, which cuts the sufferings of the demigods to pieces. It cuts the sufferings of the demigods to pieces. <coughs> so this was the mood that Akura had in approaching Vrindavan, he was humble, he felt fallen, but at the same time hopeful. I, I, there's other interesting contrasts like that. You know, devotees are very jolly, but at the same time they're sober. They're under no illusion what this material world is like, but they're jolly knowing that we're going home back to Godhead. We're going home back. We used to sing like that on the streets. He would sing in English. We're going home back to Godhead. So devotees sober, never tricked by Maya's illusions, but um, very jolly that we have the solution to material existence, and we should share it with others. So this strong conviction that one will receive <coughs> the favor of Krishna, even a new bhakta, even a fallen bhakta, will receive the favor of Krishna. This is called ashabhanda in Sanskrit. Ashabhanda. Ashabhanda means to think, um, because I'm trying my best to follow the routine principles of devotional service, I am sure I will go back, back to Godhead, back to home. Because I'm trying my best to follow the routine principles of devotional service, I'm sure I will go back home, back to Godhead. And I was thinking that um, in this connection, there's, there's one prayer by Rupa Goswami, a very, very famous prayer, but it's very relative to this particular topic now. He writes, and we find this in Bhakti Rasamrita Sindhu and the Sridhar Prabhupada's summary of Bhakti Rasamrita Sindhu, Nectar of Devotion. <coughs> Srila Rupa Goswami Prabhupada, he writes, I have no love for Krishna, nor for the causes of developing love of Krishna, namely hearing and chanting. And the process of bhakti yoga by which one is always thinking of Krishna and fixing his lotus feet in the heart is also lacking in me. As far as philosophical knowledge or pious works are concerned, I don't see any opportunity for me to execute such activities. But above all, I'm not even born in a nice family. Therefore, I must simply pray to you, O oh, Gopijana Balaba, O oh, Gopijana Balaba, uh, Krishna, maintainer and beloved of the gopis, I simply wish and hope that some way or other I may be able to approach your lotus feet. And this hope is giving me pain because I think myself quite incompetent to approach that transcendental goal of life. But there's hope. <laughs> 
the doctors, they, the medical doctors, they say, where there's life, there's hope. You know, the person's been injured in the war, a car accident, but there's some glimmer of life there in the eyes or in the breast. So there's still hope. We can still save that person. So no matter how fallen I am, Krishna's so kind, my spiritual master is so kind that if I try, I can be delivered. We have to have this hope. And actually in commenting on that beautiful verse by Rupa Goswami, <clears throat> Sri Prabhupada says, quote, the purport is that, that under this heading of Ashabanda, one should continue to hope against hope that some way or other he will be able to approach the lotus feet of the Supreme Lord. So Prabhupada is emphasizing the same thing. So, again, this was a Kura's mood in approaching Braj, humble but hopeful. And therefore he concludes, in the Bhagavatam he concludes, Maivam mama damash yapi svad eva chuta darshanam hriyamana kala natya vachit tarati kashtana vachit karati kashtana It's a our memory fails us sometimes. <laughs> he writes, it's really interesting, but enough of such thoughts. After all, even a fallen soul like me can have the chance to behold the infallible uh, Supreme Lord. For one of the conditioned souls being swept along in the river of time may sometimes reach the shore. For one of the conditioned souls being swept along in the river of time may sometimes reach the shore. So, um, just as we are <laughs> coming off the highway <laughs> from Kolkata to Mayapur and on to the, you know, there's that side road that leads off the, the highway uh, leading towards our Mayapur Chandadaira Mandir with the very large uh, temple of Vedic planetarium. You can see it in the distance. You know. As we took that turn, um, I remembered an instruction of Sridhar Prabhupada in Krishna book, uh, chapter 30, where he writes, giving us instructions how to enter the Dham. He writes, as soon as one reaches the boundary of Vrindavan, he should immediately smear the dust of Vrindavan over his body without thinking of his material position and prestige. You know, to roll in the dust and be all dirty, like, what do I look like? But it's Braj Renu. It's one of the five personalities who grants entrance into Vrindavan. <laughs> so traditionally, devotees approaching Vrindavan, they, they get out of the car and they roll in the dust. Do you do that? We should do that. Be careful, though, <laughs> not to get way off the and go in a little bit into the forest and roll there, not on the highway. And Srila Naratam Das, I remember Srila Naratam Das has sung, Vishaya, chid, uh, Vishaya Chidiya Kabe, Shuddha habe, Shuddha habe Man. That's right. When my mind will be purified, after leaving the contamination of materialistic sense enjoyment, I shall be able to visit Vrindavan. Visha Chayati Kabe, Shuddha habe Man. When my mind will be purified, after leaving the contamination of materialistic sense enjoyment, then I shall actually be able to leave Vrindavan. So, so many... Uh, we have to be qualified to go to that, those sacred places, Vrindavan, Mayapur, Jagannath Puri. And during the year, we can uh, think about if we've made progress, because, well, we do, you know, Prabhupada actually invited us, I remember, to, at one point in the Mayapur festival, he told the GBC members that all my disciples should come every year for the Mayapur festival. And it created a big commotion in the GBC. But Prabhupada, what about the preaching and the finances? Prabhupada said, no, it's so important. So, of course, time, place, and circumstance, but in our hearts we should uh, want to come and make plans if we can, even in the way the world is today, to try to visit the Dom, but prepare ourselves throughout the year. It should be one of our goals, that this year or next year, the next, I will go to Braj, I will go to Mayapur. Because coming there and practicing devotional service there, one can actually make quantum leaps in devotional service. That's the power of the Dhams, where Krishna appeared. 
So I'm remembering that <laughs> instruction in, uh, in Krishna book. I told the driver to stop. You're like, what's happening? And I told everyone out. I said, roll on the dust. Yes, Guru Maharaj. So we got out and we rolled in the dust. And of course, I prayed to our beloved Sri Prabhupada, who was the source of all our auspiciousness, all success and strength in Krishna consciousness. Because Prabhupada is for us a connection to everything Krishna conscious. So I, he's the revealer of the Nam. So anyway, by this time I felt ready to enter Mayapur. And I also realized that um, by visiting Mayapur, it's a well-known fact, I was actually preparing myself to enter Vrindavan as well. How was that? Because one of my heroes, Srila Prabodhananda Saraswati, writes in his Navadvip uh, Satakam, uh, verse uh, 78, that to enter into Vrindavan, you need the mercy of Mayapur Dham. Interesting how Prabhupada would always invite us to Mayapur for the Gorpurnim festival, and then we would go to Vrindavan. Prabhupada knew everything. So to enter into Vrindavan, you need the mercy of Sri Mayapur Dham. And he writes it very clearly. Here, here's what he writes. If you worship the nine islands of Navadweep, you are actually worshiping Vrindavan and can easily gain entrance into that confidential place. If you don't worship and take shelter of Navadweep Dham, Vrindavan will be very far away from you. Wow. If someone will worship Dvija Sutta, Dvija Sutta, uh, Sri Titanya Mahaprabhu, the son of the Brahmana Jagannath Mishra, that person will attain Braj Nagara, Sri Krishna in Vrindavan. If one worships Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, who is actually Krishna himself in Navadvip, one is performing complete worship of Krishna. Worshipping Sachinandana, Gorahari in Navadvip is as good as worshipping Krishna in Vrindavan. If one does not worship Dvija Sutta Gorahari, Krishna will be very far away. Wow. The path is very clear. The path is very clear. Back to Godhead. We have that by following the footsteps of Srila Prabhupada as, as when he lived amongst us. He also chanted 16 rounds a day. He chanted three Gayatris. He respected Prasadam. He worshipped the deities. He, he's the perfect servant. He told us how to do it, but he did it in pure Krishna consciousness. We're sadhakas. We're practicing. But, um, and, and not only his example, but in his uh, purports, his ecstasies, he makes, it makes it very clear. So if one does not worship Dvichyashuta Gaurahari, Krishna would be very far away. I remember when uh, my godbrother Guru Kripa, Prabhu, um, he found the first uh, Nishringa deity in Iskon. This is going back to the 70s. No one had deities for Nishringa. We had paintings. So he found a d beautiful deity of Lakshmi Nishringa in some antique shop somewhere in South India. And he showed him to Sridhar Prabhupada and he asked if we could worship. He, he could worship Nishringa Dev. And Prabhupada said, but Nishringa Dev is very angry and if you make offenses, it's very dangerous. But you can worship him along with Gornitai. You have to worship him along with Gornitai. Because Gornitai, they accept no offenses. Like that. So it's an inter interesting instruction. A lot of ISKCON devotees want to worship Nishringa Dev, but Prabhupada's original instruction to, to um, my godbrother was that, yes, you can worship, Day, but you have to worship him along with Gauritai to Guru Kripa. So, um, <laughs> we rolled in the dust and we remembered Akura, we rolled in the dust, we chanted our prayers, and as we drove the uh, remaining few kilometers to um, our, our big center, our temple, I was just so excited. But even more so, I was surprised when rounding that, you know, that final turn on the road, we were greeted by a large crowd of devotees 
and, and arousing kirtan, because I have lots of you know, students there. Well, they're all there. Hare Krishna, it was so nice. And I smiled, remembering what I had read recently, again in the uh, Vrindavan Research Institute, about etiquette. Etiquette, uh, uh, so, well, different types of etiquette in Vedic culture. And one passage <coughs> that I read was that, <coughs> it's really interesting. In Vedic culture, two things are celebrated in, in a very grand way. And that is the welcoming of sadhus, and the other is their departure, their farewell when they go to the next town. I didn't know that. I mean, we always like to receive, you know, I love to receive devotees, my god brothers, god sisters, you know, see them off, you know. We like to do that, but actually, these two things are really um, celebrated in a grand way, I was reading, in, in Vedic culture. And I remember how true that was when, in the 1970s, we would receive Sridhar Prabhupada, our, our welcoming of Sridhar Prabhupada in our temples was a grand affair. You know, greeting him upon his arrival and then seeing him off when he left were equally big occasions. We did it without even knowing that it's a Vedic injunction or how big it's supposed to be. Both were equal and big occasions. Receiving Prabhupada and walking him to the car and crying as he left. Both were big celebrations but with different emotions. Deep spiritual experiences. Even for the young devotees that we were. Meeting him satisfied our intense desires to be with him. And seeing him off increased our desire to see him again as soon as possible. These are all spiritual emotions. They also take place in, you know, in, in, in the spiritual world with Krishna. <laughs> but through Prabhupada we learn of these things. We get our first taste in Krishna consciousness. Meeting him, you know, when he came to the airport and we brought him to the temple, it satisfied an intense desire to be with him. And seeing him off, increased our desire to be with him again as soon as possible. Because Sridhar Prabhupada, in the 1970s, he was very much, you could, he, he really was the center of our movement in those days because of his personal presence on the earth. Nowadays, when I think about those yearly arrivals and departures of Sridhar Prabhupada in the temples that I was in, like, Detroit, I remember New York, London, Paris, Geneva, Rome, what to speak of when Prabhupada would come to, to Vrindavan or Mayapur, we would receive him and see him off. Um, I, I, when, when, I remember, when I think about that, I remember a poem that I found in the Vrindavan Research Center by a disciple of Gauri Das Pandit. His name uh, was Krishna Das. We've quoted both of them before. He was the disciple of Gauri Das Pandit. We know Gauri Das Pandit from Chaitanya Charitamrita. Kaviraj Goswami has written in Chaitanya Charitamrita, uh, Adi Lila, chapter 11, verse 26, Gauri Dasa Pandita Yanra Premo Dhanda Bhakti Krishna Prem Dita Nite Dhara Maha Shakti. He, he writes, Gauri Das Pandit, the emblem of the most elevated devotional service and love of God, had the greatest potency to receive and deliver love. That's who he was. So he had a disciple named Krishna Das, and one time he sent this disciple, Krishna Das, to Vrindavan when he was a teenager to serve the Vaishnav sadhus there. That's, that's all he said. You go to Braj, you serve the sadhus. So then historically, many years later, uh, Gauri Das Pandit announced that he would visit Vrindavan and as he was on his way there, journeying there, this disciple, Krishna Das, who later became a famous uh, poet, he wrote the following um, poem in anticipation of his guru's arrival. It's known as Guru Avni. Guru Avni means the coming uh, or the welcoming of the guru. The coming or welcoming of the Guru, it's a big thing. You know, we have always have Vani, but we don't always have um, uh, Vapu. 
Vapu means the personal association. Vani will always have. But the Vapu is sometimes here, sometimes not there. So when we get the Vapu, <laughs> so this disciple, was, you know, he's, my guru's coming after so many years. And he wrote this beautiful poem. And I feel that it perfectly, perfectly captures the mood uh, of Prabhupada's arrivals at our ISKCON temples in the 1970s. And here it is. So beautiful. Oh, today, oh, today, my dear guru will come. When I hear the news of the arrival of my dear most spiritual master, the happiness I feel cannot be described in words. Oh, friends, sing this song of happiness. Decorate the earth and sky. As soon, a palanquin will arrive with my guru. The whole world will dance and sing his glories. Bring the goddess of fortune to sweep the way for him. Call the king of elephants, Arvata, Indra's carrier, to sprinkle his way with water from its trunk. Oh, the birds are now chirping, and the earth has become residence for angels. Blow the conch, play the murdunga drums, and trumpets louder to welcome the Lord of my heart. Can't you see? The demigods are showering flowers from their flower airplanes. Soon I will welcome my guru to reside within my heart. Thank you, Krishna Das. <laughs> That's what it was like when Prabhupada came. I remember the first time I saw Prabhupada, uh, 1971, he visited our Detroit temple. I did, I'd only lived in the temple maybe, I don't know, some months. Prabhupada came to the airport. Many of his disciples came from different parts of the East Coast and the Midwest of America. And when Prabhupada came through the exit uh, into where we were waiting for him in the hall, every devotee, without exception, started crying. And just everyone fell to the ground. Oh, Prabhupada, tears. I remember very clearly. I'm looking around. Wow. <laughs> I all started crying. <laughs> the power of Sri Prabhupada to bring forth bhakti. But how can one experience bhakti when one is just a new devotee? It's bhakti. It may be green bhakti, not ripe bhakti, but it's bhakti because the object of that affection is something Krishna conscious. A Vaishnava, the guru, Prabhupada, the deity. Maybe we don't have pure devotion, but something's there from the very beginning and directed at... Um, Something, generally some person connected. It's bhakti. Prabhupada gave the example of the green mango and the ripe mango. He said, oh, it, generally we prefer the ripe mango, but the green mango is also valuable because you can make achar. Achar means pickle. I've become accustomed to achar <laughs> living in India so many years with my meal, the pickle, you know, mango pickle, lemon pickle. So Prabhupada said, yes, both the... Um, Young devotion of an aspiring devotee and the pure devotion of pure. Krishna likes both. So we're so, Prabhupada's so kind to help us experience, even from the very beginning, these emotions of, of bhakti, which encourages us to go deeper and deeper and deeper into Krishna consciousness, to get amala bhakti, pure devotion. So he's saying, the demigods are showering flowers from their flower airplanes. Soon I will welcome my guru to reside within my heart. So another poem, um, uh, uh, there's another poem by a poet, his name, uh, uh, Cheet, Cheet Swami, uh, C-H-E-E-T, Cheet Swami. He was a disciple of Bhalabhacharya. He wrote another poem I found that embodied this, um, this feeling of meeting the guru, welcoming the guru as he comes to the temple or comes into our heart. He wrote, with a flood of love in my heart, with empty hands, asking for mercy, holding a straw in between my teeth, standing humbly and bowing my head down with tears of hope, with tears of hope in my eyes, I will receive my guru and welcome him with a garland of my devotional desires. Wow. Now, our Acharyas, uh, and other famous Vaishnavas also describe 
uh, how to welcome one's guru, or let us let us say uh, just senior devotees, or just a god brother whom you hold, or god sister whom you hold in high esteem, or perhaps a younger devotee who has uh, excelled in their preaching or their lecturing or their cooking or their you know we can patitanam bhavanevyo devotee likes to honor all of the devotees actually is more advanced than himself or herself. So our our acharyas describe how to welcome well they're speaking about gurus but even senior devotees or as I was speaking, how to welcome such august personalities into one's home. They write. I'm just repeating what I read. One should offer a fragrant garland to one's guru and put it around his neck and with great joy in one's heart welcome him into one's home. Offer him a cooling drink prepared with black pepper, salt, sugar, and a little camphor to remove his fatigue of traveling. I'm quoting directly here. Then offer padya, water, to wash his feet, and then dry them with a soft cotton cloth with the utmost care. After offering him fragrant oil, one should offer the guru flowers to his lotus feet, and then offer him a lamp. After this, one should offer cooked prashad that's been offered to the Lord, to the guru, and give him a donation from one's heart. And then it's written, one who follows this vidhi, this procedure, which is called Padravani, Padravani, another nice name for a disciple, Padravani, will get a chance to welcome Radha and Krishna one day in a kunj in Vrindavan. Hmm. By properly serving our spiritual master, by serving our guru, we become qualified. We, we get the chance one day to welcome Radha and Krishna uh, in, in a kunja in Vrindavan. Please come, everything is ready for your enjoyment. <laughs> Hare Krishna. Actually, I was remembering there was once a disciple of um, Madhavinda Puri. His name was Rasik Das. Nice name, Rasik Das, who used to um, live near to the, uh, the Jumuna River. And if I remember correctly, he was a farmer. And during the day, he would um, work very hard for his family. And late at night, he would um, cross the river Jamuna to meet his guru, uh, Madhavinda Puri, at, uh, at Yatipur. This was going, this is historical. This is uh, when Madhavinda Puri was living in Vrindavan. So he would cross the river Jamuna um, to, to meet his guru, Madhavinda Puri, at Yatipur, along with other disciples. And at those meetings, um, it's described Madhavinda Puri would discuss <laughs> Krishna consciousness <laughs> and have kirtan with his disciples for many hours. We're doing the same thing now. <laughs> and this Rasik Das, who also became later a Vaishnava poet, he writes something very nice. Just this relationship between guru and disciple, it's so sweet because we're being taught to serve the sweetest of the sweet. Madhura, Madhura, Madhura. Krishna. So he writes, uh, Rasik Das writes, when our guru comes from Aniyor to Yatipur in the evening, we welcome him by performing various dances. After that, he gives us the nectar of Krishna Kata, which makes us intoxicated with love of Krishna. Just describing a, describing an historical instance there. When I see my spiritual master, he writes, singing the names and glories of Sri Gopal, the Lord himself comes and dances in the kirtan. How blessed we are to be with our spiritual master. Now, I noted that being the devotee that he was, obviously he's a very advanced personality, Rasik Das, he also had glorification for his god brothers and god sisters. He not only adored his spiritual master, but he adored his god brothers and god sisters. I always think that 
by the mercy of my God brothers and God sisters, by serving with them, I can understand the glories of my spiritual master. Without them, it's not possible. And by the mercy of my spiritual master, I understand the glories of Krishna. Hari Guru Vaishnava Bhagavata Gita Nartam says, Hari Guru Vaishnava Bhagavata Gita. Lord, Guru, and the Vaishnavas. Service to all is equally important. So this devotee, Rasik Das, after so nicely glorifying his spiritual master, he had words of glorification for his god brothers and god sisters. He wrote about it. And here's what he wrote. I read it. Oh, when will they, the devotees, my, my god brothers and god sisters, meet with me? Only by taking shelter in their names, all ignorance is vanquished. And I feel bliss and happiness. For whoever falls in love with them, Lord Giridhari will roam behind them. Whoever gets the association of such souls is most fortunate. So many valuable instructions. Now, the Shastras say that when the spiritual master comes to the house of a disciple, the Lord protects such disciples from all sorts of miseries and problems. I was reading. And the Lord even stands guard <laughs> at the door of that house to protect the disciples from the Yamadudas. Hmm? If your spiritual master comes to your home, because he's, for the disciple, he's Krishna's representative. He's the ambassador of the Lord in this dangerous world. So if you welcome him in some of the ways, or all of the ways that we've been describing today, from Acharyas and from Scripture, and what these wonderful examples of the devotees who are receiving their spiritual masters and their um, saviors, those who inspire them in devotional service. Then it says, the spiritual master, when the spiritual master comes to the house of such a disciple, the Lord protects the disciples from all sorts of miseries and even stands guard at the door of the house. <laughs> if the Yamadu does come, sorry, you can't come in. <laughs> and we should never think that the glories of the holy names uh, are exaggeration. There's no exaggeration in the philosophy or the practices or the results of Krishna consciousness. It's the wonderful world of Krishna consciousness. Now it's also written that walking in the welcoming procession for the guru, like the guru's coming and then, you know, you, you join that procession, you know, and then your, that procession goes to the temple and the spiritual master pays obeisances to Sridhar Prabhupada and then the deities and then, you know, maybe you welcome him into your home. It's written that walking in the welcoming procession for the guru destroys the sins of 42 previous lifetimes. I read it. Walking in the uh, welcoming procession of the guru destroys sins of 42 previous lifetimes. Also, it's said that one who dances in front of the spiritual master upon his arrival will never dance in front of the material energy of the Lord ever again. One who dances in front of the spiritual master at his arrival, because this, this class is about, you know, the welcoming and the, the sending the guru off to the next destination, these two things. So one who dances uh, <laughs> upon his arrival, he'll never dance again in front of the material energy, Maya. Now, in Vedic culture, it's also said, Atiti Devo Bhaya. Atiti Devo Bhaya. It means the guest is as good as God. Just the guest. And Krishna demonstrated that. In Krishna's kingdom in Dwarka, it's described that if a Brahmana came to, to Dwarka, Krishna would send guards to welcome him. And many of, many of you know, of course, there was once a friend of Krishna who studied with him, and Guru Kola's name was Sudama, and he was from a poor Brahmin family. And when Krishna heard that Sudama had come to visit him, he ran very fast and welcomed him. Welcomed him. Not only that, but he placed him on you know, his own royal seat. Krishna has a royal seat in Dwarka. And in front of the whole court, he washed that Brahmana's feet with his own tears. And it said that from one side, 
Rukmini was pouring, I was reading, from one side, Rukmini was pouring water on Sudama's feet with a five-streamed water pot. No? I read this. Rukmini was pouring you know, water on Sudama's feet. And that pot, that beautiful pot, had five streams coming out at the same time. But I was reading, but Krishna's tears were more than that of that five-streamed water pot. That, that water pot's called a, a Panch Mukhi Kalash. And Krishna's tears were bathing <laughs> Sudama's feet more than that water pot. Oh, so much instructions on welcoming the Lord, the Guru, the devotees. Um, yes, I, I, it's the same, same as in Treta Yuga. I, I was reading in the Ramayana the other day that whenever a highly advanced Brahman or a Vaishnava would visit a king, the same way the king would stand and place the sadhu on the royal seat and wash his feet with his own hands. And there's many examples in, in the history of the Puranic history of the world, how great souls were received, like Vashishta Muni, Vishwamrita, Narada Muni, there's so many examples. And um, uh, I was reading that in olden days, I was reading a history book, so much nectar in that institute, in the olden days, Kings used to have what's called Chatura Nani Senas. Chatura Nani Senas. It means they, ha they literally had five armies to, re to receive exalted persons upon their arrival in the kingdom. Five armies. Like what? Some great sadhu is coming. So there's five armies to receive them. <laughs> and what were those armies? Well, soldiers. But specifically this term Chaturna uh, Nani Senas, an army of elephants, number one, an army of horses, number two, an army of camels, number three, and an army of chariots, number four. Vedic culture was so amazing. So people from everywhere used to come and witness these events. Now, I've seen here in Vrindavan, you know, the greetings take a little bit different form because who has an army of camels? Who has an army of horses? An army of elephants? <laughs> who sits on a royal throne that can get off? <laughs> We're trying to be humble Vaishnavas. So here in Vrindavan, greetings take a little different form, although the bhav, the devotion, is still there. It takes a different form because of the natural humility of, of the sadhus, the Bajabasis. So welcoming is done here, it's described, with sweet words, beautiful garlands, and prasadam. Uh, one sadhu told me, in Braj, welcoming means feeding. <laughs> in Braj, welcoming, you know, a lot of things you learn from the Brajabhasis. One devotee told me many years ago, if you really want to know Braj, you have to go out to the outer villages, you know, to where the people live the simple life and they're, you know, taking care of the cows and cultivating the fields and they all have their deity, the main deity in the village and they do all the festivals and, you know, Western materialism hasn't contaminated those places so much. If you really want to know Braj, go out there. And I do. And I love those Brajabhasis. So one Brajabhasi, he smiled. He had no teeth. Maraj, in Braj, welcoming means feeding. <laughs> and he said there's a famous saying in Vrindavan that Welcoming a guru or sadhu is incomplete without feeding them with six different tastes of food to their full satisfaction. And I see that also in the sense that, you know, when I go on Purkama with devotees, or I just go on Purkama with one or two devotees, we're somewhere in Braj, some of the villages, or so often the people meet us and they, please come for Prasad. Please come. You know, they, they want to serve. They want to feed you. <laughs> they want to feed you. I don't know how many times I'm walking down a little lane, a little village, and some gentleman will come out, ah, Maraj, Prasad, and you cannot say no. You, you, because to say no would be very offensive. You don't want to offend the Brajabasis. <laughs> Sometimes I walk through a village, I have five breakfasts. It's always roti, sabji, some, some dahi. Healthy, you know, they milk the cow in front of you. <laughs> they grind the wheat, they cook, you know, this really good. But that's the culture, feeding the sadhus. 
And also previously uh, in Vrindavan, I was reading that when an elevated sadhu would come, the people would uh, greet him and part of the greeting was they would lightly put what they call mushtik, mushtik, a type of soft dough made from flour on his eyelids to protect him from the evil eyes of envious persons who gaze at him in his travels as he roams around the country. So detailed, so wonderful, this culture. We can't lose it. We can't lose it. We have to imbibe this culture and spread it all around the world. We don't want to embrace We've ran away from Western culture. We don't want to drag it in <laughs> to our Krishna consciousness and our lifestyle as devotees. Of course, you know, we, there's logic in that, you know, like Prabhupada said, if you go out to distribute books, then you should wear Western dress if you can distribute more books. And we have our work and, you know, so forth. But when there's festivals and when we're in the Dham and whenever appropriate, you know, we can be very proud to exhibit um, our, our culture. In conclusion, <laughs> there are a few welcomings of the Lord that are very famous in our Shastras. Uh, I was reading this. There's, there's actually four very famous welcomings because we've been speaking about welcomings. Uh, the welcoming of Uddhava in Vrindavan by the gopis um, when, when, he, when he came to uh, Vrindavan after Krishna had left Vrindavan. Uh, the second is the welcoming of Lord Ramachandra with Sita to Ayodhya after the Asura Ravana had been killed. That We celebrate that as Diwali. <laughs> Uh, the third grand welcoming was the welcoming of Krishna by the uh, Dwarkavashis after winning the battle at uh, Kurukshetra. And the other grand uh, welcoming was wel welcoming Mahaprabhu by the Brajabhasis when Mahaprabhu came to visit Vrindavan. Wow. And for me, I remember the welcoming of Srila Prabhupada. For me, it's just as important. So in this way, we can remember these things. We can, re we can serve our spiritual masters. We can serve the devotees. We can think of all the Vaishnavas in this way and um, honor them, respect them, and, and, and worship them. And that pleases Krishna very much. So yeah, that, and then, uh, well, we had a welcoming. <laughs> we had a welcoming when we came into, in, into Mayapur. Oh, it was very nice. And I got to speak. You know, when the sa sadhu comes, then, you know, there's some honor given to him, which he immediately gives to his spiritual master. But then it's his duty to share the most precious thing, what those devotees are hungry for. Krishna Kata and Kirtan. <laughs> it's such a wonderfully simple movement. Chanting, dancing, feasting, and then one day we all go home. Back home, back to Godhead. Sridhar Papa did say, one day we will have our ISKCON movement in the spiritual sky. We're so blessed and let's bring others into the fold so they can also be blessed and go back home, back to God here. Hare Krishna. Thank you so much, Prabhu. Really enjoyed um, sharing this knowledge with you today and um, be back in a couple of days. Shishi Gorni Thai Ki, Shishi Krishna Balaram Ki, Shishi Radha Shama Sundar Ki, Vrindavaneshwari Shimati Radharani Ki, Shishi Gorni Thai Ki, Back Home Back to Godhead Ki, Shri Krishna Sankirtanya Ki, ki Gaur Premanandi, Jay Jay Sisi Radhe Shri.